Good afternoon. Today is 2 February, the year 2007. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in those conflicts. Today I'm here at the museum along with special guest Rosalie Spooner and today we have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Lieutenant David Spooner. Lieutenant Spooner was a cadet in the Royal Military College of Canada in the 1950s and grew up in China during World War II. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. Dave, nice to have you here. Yeah, nice to meet you, Dave. Okay. Now, uh, would you uh, state and spell your full name for us, please? All right. David, D-A-V-I-D, -D, Spooner, S-P-O-O-N-E-R. Okay. And when and where were you born? I was born in Chengdu, China in April 24th, 1933. And Chengdu, how do you spell that? C-H-E-N-G-D-U. It used to be TU, but they changed to the Communists changed it to DU. They're good at that, aren't they? Yeah. Changing things. <laughs> um, and uh, your dad, what was his name? My dad was Roy Spooner, and uh, he was a professor of chemistry at West China Union University in, Chen in Chengdu. Chengdu. And he went out in 1931. Okay, and um, uh, his background, uh, where did your ancestors all come from? Did they come from Europe or, or, or where? Uh, they were all from around uh, Toronto. Mm -hmm. An amusing little story is that uh, when my father did some research on the family name, there were two saddleback preachers called Spooner who came up after the uh, Civil War to Canada. And uh, one of them went into Quebec, and uh, of course it's completely Catholic and very Catholic in those mm -hmm. days. And he was never heard of again. <laughs> and the other one came to Ontario, and we're descended from that branch. Mm -hmm. However, I got a very nice phone call a few years ago, and with a person with an accent, French Canadian accent, and his name was Spooner. So, and he invited us. He talked a little while. He invited us to come and stay at his motel outside of Montreal. So, I think what may have happened is that preacher came went up to Quebec, met a pretty little <laughs> French Canadian girl, and uh, so now there's a Spooner branch that speaks mm -hmm. French. Oh, okay. <laughs> that is interesting. Um, and your mother, what was her name, her maiden her, name? Her name was Kathleen Ferguson. And her background, her ancestors were? Uh, they came from Scotland in the 1800s, mm -hmm. and uh, they settled down near a place called Caledonia. And, uh, in Canada? In, in, in Canada, in Ontario. And uh, one of her um, uncles, would it be uncles? No. Uh, let's we, take a pause here for sure. sure. I'd rather. Let's take this. Let's get One side of her family was a Robinson, who was a doctor who worked, uh, served with uh, Wellington and fought at the Battle of Waterloo. And oh uh, he came to Canada, that branch of the family, much earlier, and uh, they settled up near a place called Aurelia on Lake Kuchiching. So uh, This is all in Canada? This is all in Canada, okay. yes. Lake, Now, where is Lake, uh, I mean, I know Lake Ontario, uh, Lake, but... They, no, no. Uh, Toronto, Lake Kuchiching is about 60 miles north of uh, Lake Ontario. And where did your mom and dad meet? Uh, at university. They were at the University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they met there, and uh, I think my father fell rather hard for her. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was interested in uh, going to China, and uh, I think she sort of said, marry me, and we'll go to China together. <laughs> and so so, so uh, my father decided that it was, the bride was worth the trip to China. Okay. So he was very interested in uh, in teaching and, and helping out this way. Uh -huh. um, had he taught in Canada before they went to China? No, uh, he was uh, a research chemist at Arvida, uh, a branch of the Aluminum Company of Canada. Okay. And um, do you have any brothers and sisters? Uh, two sisters, both born in China. And what are their names? Hillary is the older one, 
and uh, she would be 71, and Nora is uh, the younger one, and she's 69. And um, um, uh, are they, where, where do they live now? Uh, they both live in uh, Canada. One lives in, ha Hillary lives in uh, Hamilton. She married a, uh, a Kaler from Worcester, Massachusetts, and they both live in Hamilton. And uh, another interesting story is the Kalers were our Mayflower descendants. And uh, uh, anybody who's Mayflower descendants is sort of pleased. Yeah. And uh, lo and behold, my father kept on re doing some research. As you may or may not know, there's a Spooner house in Boston. <laughs> it turns out that I'm a Mayflower descendant as well, <laughs> which we never knew until my father, after he retired, did some research. Huh, well, and yeah. Nora married a chap, Bill Hewson, who was a general in the Canadian Armed Forces, and is about three years behind me at military college. Mm -hmm. And there they settled outside of Ottawa. Okay. And um, so, um, how did your dad get posted over to China? How did you, what did you have to go through? To well, to so. Another interesting story, the previous chemistry professor in at Chengdu, uh, there was a, a, a bit of an insurrection and uh, a, a Chinese uh, uh, terrorist, you might say, yeah, right. came up and behind him and uh, took his head off and uh, that was the end of the chemistry professor and the church wrote back and said that they were desperately in need of a new chemistry professor and would my father please come and uh, and help out? So that was his his modus operandi of getting to Chengdu. Because yeah, I was going to ask you, I know back in the 30s uh, there were there was a lot of I don't know if the Boxer Rebellion was going yeah. on then, but there were a lot of that kind of stuff going on. I remember right. the the, the gunship Panay uh, uh, in the Yangtze River uh, right, was the, a big deal. Got that was the movie. The movie I think was made of that. I th yeah, I yeah. think so. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Steve McQueen was in that. Yeah. Uh, um, but anyhow, so, and uh, um, tell us a little bit about your childhood and what it was like. Uh, <clears throat> there was quite a, a group of uh, people there, diplomatic and so on, during the war years, which I basically what I remember. And there was like a Canadian school, and I attended that school, so up to about the age of five or six, Basically, my first language was Chinese, mm -hmm. and I lost this as I went to school, and uh, so now all the only Chinese I can speak are a few terrible swear words, <laughs> which I won't repeat, and I can count to ten. <laughs> so when you were, uh, before you actually started school, that's when you spoke Chinese, did you have a, a Chinese people that helped out at the house and things like that? Right, we, well, you, you pretty well had to. There's no refrigeration, there's very little electricity, and uh, uh, we had a deep well, and anything that we wanted to keep uh, cool, we put on a, in a basket and lowered into the well, and it went down 60 feet, and it was much mm -hmm. colder yes. down there. You sure. probably know that. I know, I'm living in the, from the, <laughs> and out in the country and the Midwest, yeah. So it was probably universal, that sort of a, sort of a cool, uh, Covered and uh, so we had a cook and a uh, gardener and a ama to help look after the kids. Mm -hmm. And so they spoke Chinese, and so you picked it up from right. them probably. What about the, any Chinese kids that you played with? Yes, it was. Uh, I played with quite a few Chinese kids. They were uh, they were at the school as well. And uh, did, did, was it like a a, a, co a compound, or did you just live out in the city with everybody else, or? or well, when they built the university, they weren't allowed to build in the city. So the university was actually outside the city walls. It started around 1905, I believe. And so we were sort of outside the city proper at that time. And uh, there was a large to, uh, since the education was very poor, that there was a large uh, junior school and middle school that was all Chinese. And the kids who went to this, the Chinese kids who went to this then, could go on to university. And they really had a, an excellent medical school there, dental school. They had an agricultural school, uh, a chap called Mr. Dickinson. Uh, they, they brought uh, livestock out to try to improve the local herds and so on. 
And uh, so it was uh, quite a university, and I believe today it's quite large, mm -hmm. 20, 30,000 mm -hmm. students. The town, when you were there, what was the population? How big a town was it? Oh, Lord. Uh, I would say half a million. Really? And today I think it's up around four million, five million. Is that right? Yeah. Quite large. Yeah. Um, so what did your kids do for fun? Uh, well, it was very hard to lose us because we were blonde and white and everybody else was Chinese and dark hair. Yeah. So we were pretty well given free range. There was no problem. Uh, it's, um, there was no problem with uh, kidnapping because if anybody was kidnapped, there was no ransom ever paid because that just encouraged more kidnappings. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ranged quite, we could go see our friends on the other side of uh, the uh, university area, which is a fair size. And we went out into the countryside often. And there was a, a river about a couple of miles away that we used to often go as a group out and go swimming there. Mm -hmm. And uh, very carefree, very much like Tom Sawyer or Huckleberry Finn. Uh, and we all could speak Chinese, so uh, there was very little problem there. Um, now, 1937 is when uh, I think the Japanese, like Nanking and all that right. kind of stuff. Now, you were only like four years old then. You probably don't remember any of that stuff, do you? No. Uh, uh, I can remember we, uh, in 1938, my father came back to North America uh, for his furlough. He had been out there seven years. And every seven years, you're allowed to go back home. And uh, an interesting, uh, a Dorothy Harkness had trapped a panda. And the first panda to arrive in the United States died. And my father took the panda. We have pictures of uh, ourselves and then the children in the area playing with the panda in our backyard in Chengdu. And he took the panda back to uh, Los Angeles and delivered it there, and that was the famous Pandora. I think one of the longest lived pandas ever at the Chicago Zoo. And of course the reason I think that the panda did so well was it was under the tender loving care of my father because he was getting uh, his way paid at MIT. And he wanted to do some gra more graduate work, a postdoctoral type of thing, at MIT. So this is, missionaries aren't paid very much. So this is how he earned the money to go and do a year's study at MIT. So by bringing the panda to North America. So again, we have uh, some photographs and so on. He was quite a good uh, photographer. That was, it was intimately related to uh, chemistry in those days because you had to do all your own developing and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have some photographs of the kids in the backyard of the panda and my father with the panda board, the, uh, the steamship going back. And a picture when we ride in Honolulu with dad's got the panda in his arms and, his knee around his neck. <laughs> so your dad was a missionary as well? Well, he was with the church, so he, was, okay. he wasn't he was a religious missionary in that aspect, but obviously he had quite a, a, a commitment my mother had too, because it's all three of us were born in China, and in those days they, we, there weren't the medical facilities that there are today, and uh, giving birth was a, a little more dangerous at that time than it is today. And so they both had quite a, uh, a religious uh, component to their makeup. Right. And so you went to church a lot when you were growing up? Uh, yeah, family, regularly. What, what, uh, what church was that that you went to? Well, it's the United Church of Canada, which was an amalgamation of Methodist, Presbyterian, and, <laughs> and Congregationalist. Mm -hmm. So it was crazy to have a Congregationalist church in one corner, a Methodist church here, and a Presbyterian here in a large, large country. So a few wise minds got together and they said, well, why don't we, we're all roughly the same, maybe we can agree on something. Yeah. And that, that's the United Church of Canada. Okay. Um, then, um, so what, what was the school like? I mean, it was a, like we have here, uh, eight, gr eight grades of grammar school and four years of high school and then on the university or college? Or ba what? Basically, that, that's what it was. It followed the Ontario system and they, we have what we call senior matriculation exams. Some of these terms are partly British. A junior matriculation in those days, a senior matriculation. So they had eight years of elementary school with the kindergarten, and then the high school, and they had a Dr. Lewis Walmsley, uh, was the principal of the Canadian school in Chengdu, and they had an enrollment, I think, of roughly 150. And they had teachers that were brought out, 
and the uh, missionaries, the medical, there were quite a few medical missionaries, because the idea was that if with proper education with the university and so on, the Chinese would then be able to take over all of these functions on their own. So there was naturally a theological component, but they had uh, stations, they called it, and there'd be no education for the uh, person, the doctor or the doctor uh, minister who was in that station uh, for their children. So their children would be boarded at the uh, Canadian school in Chengdu. So it ran, let me think, I think almost from the start, about 1905 to uh, 1943, I think it, it sort of ceased and then it sort of continued in a, in a truncated smaller form with some of the mothers actually doing the teaching because we were there until 45 and there were about 15 of us younger children there. And then it started up again after the war and ran briefly until the communists closed it down. And did the uh, uh, Chinese toler tolerate uh, you foreigners, so to speak, being there? I, I think so very well. They were, uh, there was, uh, basically, it's what we're trying to do in Afghanistan and <laughs> Iraq. Yeah. We're trying to help, right. basically. And uh, uh, I think a great deal, at one, ironically, at one point, somebody pointed out to me that every one of the communist lead leaders from Mao Zedong to Chu Enlai uh, to some of the others were all Christian educated. They all received their... <laughs> their education in some school run by Americans or by the uh, Canadians or, yeah. or the Brits, the, Sol the uh, I think Salvation Army I think was there too and there's some Anglican or Episcopal. But you know the warlords you hear about and all that kind of stuff I mean it was not in their best interest to have you guys around. No. So, and so I mean did they give you guys a, give the uh, Amer uh, uh, a they, they tolerated us as long as we didn't interfere too much. And I don't know if I can relate this story, story properly, but there's a Dr. Lillestrand who was quite a remarkable doctor. And he died a few years ago in his 90s. And uh, he was living in Hawaii at the time, he's an American. And <clears throat> he came about, what, three years ago to a, a China reunion. We have a reunion every year. And he told this rather interesting story that he was at the medical school in Chengdu. This would be in the uh, 20s. and they needed catabars for the uh, medical students to work with and dissect and so on and learn, you know, <laughs> where the spleen was as compared to the gallbladder. And unfortunately, these uh, corpses that were delivered to them were in awful bad shape. They were bruised and banged up and they are all sorts. So he uh, had the opportunity at one time, he's going to have a lunch with the local warlord. So he didn't know whether he dared to, but near the end of the meal, very pleasant meal and very formal, he... Uh, he approached, he said, he says, you know, those cadavers that you deliver to us, they're in very poor shape. Is there any way you could deliver them in better shape? <laughs> well, about three, <laughs> I guess about a few weeks later, there's this knock on the door and his assistant went down and he came up and he said, doctor, doctor, there are three soldiers at our door with somebody. And uh, yeah, he says, well, usher them in. So they, they came in. And uh, there are two army gentlemen there with these two horrible looking specimens with their arms tied behind their backs. And uh, they said, the warlord says <laughs> that you need <laughs> good cadavers. Here are two prisoners. Do with them as you wish. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I'm not sure what exactly happened after that. That was the end of the story. But yeah. Um. And did you enjoy going to school there? Yes, I uh, quite enjoyed it. Did, what did you like? Uh, did you, what kind of sports? Did you play sports or anything uh, like Soccer. That? Uh, mm -hmm. And then I ran track and field in high school and yeah. I was on the, the university uh, swim team. Okay. And I swam competitively. Oh, did you? Oh. And, what uh, stroke? What, what uh, crawl uh -huh. and some backstroke. Yeah. Freestyle, we yeah. call it a crawl, yeah. I believe. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, okay. Um, what did you... What classes did you like the best? What did you like to study in school? Oh, my, my mother was a history uh, specialist. She took history at university, and she actually attended a few classes at Oxford. Uh, this was after she was, we came back to Canada. Mm -hmm. And she was very keen on history, 
and so I have always enjoyed history. My father's a chemist, mm -hmm. so I always enjoyed chemistry. So, and I've always enjoyed mathematics. I taught junior mathematics, junior college, mm -hmm. and so uh, I was sort of. <laughs> I didn't really know where to go after high school because I could have gone any of these directions. And Okay, now let's kind of get into the war. The Japanese, um, I guess I, I should add, ask, were there any Americans at, at this, where you were at that school? And Yes, the uh, there's uh, uh, David Roy and Stephen Roy. Uh, David Roy was with the American uh, External Affairs and he grew up with me, we were the same age. And he spoke perfect Chinese. When they came back to North America, there was enough money in the family that they hired a private tutor. And he maintained his Chinese. So he was over, I think, with, uh, oh, the time of Johnson and uh, Kennedy and, uh, let's see, I guess it would be maybe with the senior Bush. But he's one of the senior people in, their part, in your Department of External Affairs and with a perfect Chinese accent. He was able to communicate and was, uh, I think, a very valuable person and quite a bright person. And uh, so there are a fair number of Americans uh, here as well because there, there was these, when the war broke out, the universities all got moved to Chengdu. So we had uh, some universities that were American supported and, the, and for years America has done a great deal, the USA has done a great deal in uh, helping China out. And, um, I think there's a, a sense of betrayal when the, the communists sort of turned on us. Like, you know, we had, we weren't asking anything returned. It was basically, we were being, it was an altruistic uh, uh, thing, and and yet here we were being made out to being these villains, <laughs> sort of. But uh, anyway, so there were uh, about half, I think, were US, American citizens. Um. When did you first, when, when's your first recollection of, of the war, or, you know? Well, we came back in 38, my dad attended MIT, and then we went back in, as war was breaking out in September 39. So going across the uh, Pacific, it was, all lights were out, because the war had broken out by that time, and it was, um, there was quite a definitely, it was more a state of readiness, because they weren't sure there were any, any uh, German submarines in. And of course, Jap Japan was making threatening noises all along. Yes. We arrived in Hong Kong, and again, uh, there was some uh, state of preparedness. My father, uh, with a Dr. McClure, a medical doctor, who was the, became the, sort of the moderator for the United Church of Canada uh, for a part of the time, and then he worked in the Philippines after the war, uh, when he was figured he was too old to do surgery, but he could do cataracts because that's a simple operation. So he went back to the Philippines and did hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cataracts. But anyway, uh, Dr. McClure, my father, took medical supplies down to Rangoon, picked up the medical supplies to the hospitals, and then they went up the old Burma Road all the way through into China, and they arrived there, I think, the day before Christmas. Uh, there'd be 39. And of course, that was a big surprise. They they, they made it, and uh, that was qu quite quite something. There's uh, it's been written about before, but again, uh, my father <laughs> was uh, on one of the buses with Dr. McClure, uh, one of the trucks, and uh, he noticed the uh, the door was wired shut, and uh, he, he said to McClure, he said. Uh, uh, how come these doors are wired shut? And McClure said, well, we don't have any brakes. We, we don't want you to jump out. <laughs> so it was, a, if you can imagine going over the mountains mm -hmm. and these ancient uh, trucks mm -hmm. with no brakes and so on. But anyway, they arrived safely with the medical supplies, which were desperately needed to help with the war, because China had been at war for a number of years at that time, and to help with the hospital and the, in, in Chengdu. And China and Japan have always kind of hated each other, have they not? I mean, not just then, but I think for a long time, or do you, what's the, what's the history of that? Uh, well, the, for years, China was inward and was very, very powerful. They turned themselves, they, they came up with so many new inventions, like one thing after another, 
the Arabs may have got the idea of numbers from the Chinese, gunpowder, you name it, uh, telescopes, the, uh, a compass. They're, they're all Chinese inventions. And, but then they, w they turned inward because they're such a large country. And uh, Japan was very inward too until the Americans came in there and uh, uh, sort of introduced trade and so on and broke down some of the barriers. And I think the, the Japanese got, I think it was mainly the Japanese, they got these sort of the imperial, like Germany, uh, dreams of ruling the, 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 the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And uh, in effect, they, I, I think they were the, they saw China was sort of split up with the warlords and so on. And uh, uh, part of the problem being after the Japanese attacked China, the John Kai Shek had to go into the interior where there were fewer educated people and the warlords were very powerful. Whereas around the, on the coastal area, it was more educated, there's more, the, the level of society was higher, you might say, and, you, and democracy was beginning to come about. So, uh, I, I, and I think the atrocities that the Chinese committed against the Chinese, the Japanese, the Japanese committed against the Chinese, and uh, even the, against the, uh, the, some of the Christians, I, I, I've heard of stories of them in the northern parts of China saying, you're Christian, well, we're, we're going to do away with you, and we'll do away with you the same way that you did your religious leader, and they're crucified. Mm -hmm. and, uh, which, as we all know, is a horrible way to die. And uh, the, uh, so I, I think this attitude culture, you might, might say in Japan, uh, where if you defeated somebody, they were nothing. They, they, there's no That's real why code. They, they didn't have a code of honor. Treated their that, that prisoners had, yeah. so b badly. Yeah. Much more so than the Germans, for instance. Right. They treated on over there. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, I, I, I think there is now a sort of a long felt resentment of many Chinese. Uh, even myself, I'm a little dubious because we were in Hong Kong and shortly after we left Hong Kong, the Japanese attacked Hong Kong and the, the nurses in the hospital were raped and killed. And uh, the, uh, the, there's a, actually it was a token, we didn't realize at the time, but they sent out I think the first Winnipeg rifles to Hong Kong under Churchill suggesting, and of course the, this was basically a peacetime group, of, like uh, they were sending the National Guard with, <laughs> with, with under peacetime conditions to into a war zone, and they, they fought bravely, but they were they were basically slaughtered, and uh, and the, those who were, were killed were, t were put in were taken prisoner and had a very very rough time of it in Japan. Yeah. Um, so uh, do you, um, do you remember being fearful? Uh, during the war years over there? Um, I'll just continue. Uh, when we, I can remember in 30, I think it would be, uh, be 39 or the first part of 40, uh, sit, the Japanese bombed Chengdu. They bombed it several yeah. times. Oh, yeah. So we had trenches in our front yard where, and we had dugouts where we were supposed to go. And <clears throat> uh, I remember the first time that, I, that we saw them bombing Chengdu, uh, I saw these chi Chinese Air Force, they had a couple of biplanes and from the First World War, and these went up to try to engage the Japanese bombers and of course shot down. And it was sort of, you know, you've seen it from 5,000, 10,000 feet away, so it's, it's almost surreal there. Mm -hmm. They just see the things fluttering down like this, but of course it was somebody was in that plane. Mm -hmm. And we were uh, bombed fairly extensively, and often we were told to get away from the city. And I remember one time being out, we were out sort of hiding under some bamboos and so on like this, and a Japanese bomber uh, went over us at about 200 feet or 300 feet. And it's, it's quite a terrifying feeling because there's the roar of the engines, and you're quite young, and you, you think you're hidden down there, but nevertheless you're completely defenseless if they wanted to open fire. Mm -hmm. So it's a, uh, it was quite a... a I remember that experience. That sort of impressed it on my, my young memory, and uh, we. I'll let Rosalie tell this story about the, the, the teacups that my father was. Uh, do you want Rosalie, to go, go ahead? Go ahead, Rosalie. Because I think my dad told Rosalie actually. Oh, okay. Well, it, 
sort of doesn't have really very much to do with war, but in another way it has a lot to do with it. We have teacups in our china cabinet, and they're small uh, demitasse Wedgwood teacups, and they're obviously have been uh, very shattered because they're mended in the old fashion. Yeah. It looks like very large staples, the, the way they're mended. And the story is that Dave's father was uh, afraid that they were going to get smashed during the bombings, and so he was hiding them under the stairs, and <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> Uh, but they had them repaired, they brought them back to Canada, and they were passed on to us, and they sit in the china cabinet, oh and I show them to the grandchildren, and that, o that sort of opens up mm -hmm. the story yeah. of their grandfather and great-grandparents' uh, yeah. life in China. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's an amazing story. Yeah. Um, do you want me to well, go on and mention well, with the uh, the... Base is being built there. Well, yeah, well, but not quite yet. Um, okay. Um, was uh, Shanghai Shex, was his um, uh, nationalist forces, were they in your area or was uh, the communists were, uh, in that area? The, the communists came through in the Great March, that they, uh, what they call. And uh, we had a special <laughs> section of the house where there's a trap door hidden. So if they, they passed within about 50 miles of Chengdu, so the idea was, I think that it's roughly about that, but they, we took all the anything that we had that was valuable and we placed it in this special hiding place. But the communists were in the northern part; they were north of us in China, and Chiang Kai-shek with his troops was in the area. We have uh, some pictures of Chiang Kai-shek at uh, the university mm -hmm. with the staff there, and uh, he had a large farm just outside of Chengdu because uh, this this. Uh, Dickinson, forget his first name, uh, was in charge of improving stock. So uh, I remember we were rather foolish. Uh, if you're uh, anybody who's a farmer will remember this. We took a shortcut through the <laughs> the area where the bulls were kept oh, one time. Yeah. <laughs> we had to run for our lives <laughs> as kids. And he had uh, some peacocks there and some other things. It's the main reason why he went up to to, to uh, look around. But John Kaishek had a fairly large presence in there because Chengdu was quite important at that time. Still, and he had a, a garrison there, more or less. Or yeah, he had it right like that during the war. Right. How uh, 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 reliable they were, I don't know. Uh, uh, my, my mother could speak Chinese. My father could speak impeccable Chinese, and I still don't know how he did it. In about three years, he learned how to speak Chinese, write Chinese, read Chinese. And, uh, uh, and all his lectures were given in uh, Chinese uh, to the uh, students. Yeah. So uh, it was uh, kind of remarkable. Now it slips my mind. Uh, uh, oh, but we were on, we we're getting on a bus. This would be about 1942, and uh, some soldiers got on the bus, and they these would be John Guy Sheck's uh, soldiers, and. I think they were going to uh, either evict some people or ask, it takes some money. They're going to hold it, basically. My mother got up, and I've never seen her do this before. She started to swear at them. And the most talented, influential swears in the world are the Chinese. They can, you know, go back three generations <laughs> and, and imply all sorts of horrible things and go forward and backwards and... My mother, <laughs> she turned the air blue. And the two soldiers looked sh shocked at this Western woman just tearing a hide off them. They got off the bus and left us alone. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, the, what, their, the yes. uh, general public, what was their feelings about Shanghai Shek and the, his troops? And uh, I think at first they, they supported him. Then as the, as the time went on, they became more corrupt and they took more advantage, and uh, soldiers generally were not trusted. They, they were, it was, uh, they had the gun and they, they could do anything sort of a thing. And, and do you think that's why the communists were able to later on take over the corruption? And, you know, yeah, the, the, uh, it, was, it was the corruption. I think John kai -shek was pushed away from his power base along the coast for industrialists and the industrial society there. Guangdong province is sort of the industrial powerhouse of China right now. And even in those days, it was 
much ahead of Sichuan, which is quite primitive. Uh, you may have heard Brits talk about Cockneys and the sort of they looked a little bit down their nose at their, their language. Well, Sichuanese, which is what I grew up learning, is sort of looked down the same way by many Chinese. And they'll profess they can't understand a word you are saying <laughs> because it's not Mandarin or Cantonese. So um, it was quite a backward area. And uh, so, it, so he was pushed away from this more educated area to, into a backward area where the warlords were sort of numero uno. Seems like when you go to a Chinese restaurant, the Sichuan is very hot, spicy. Yes. Yeah. Is that correct? What's it That's like that? That's right. Yeah, where, where, very, where very, very, very nice food. I think the only the some Indian curry is hotter. <laughs> <laughs> but you acquired a taste for it, or I mean, did that would you yep, grow up on sorry. that pretty much? Pretty well. If uh, we didn't like what my parents were eating, we'd go out and eat with the uh, the, the, the servants in the servants' quarters. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about the Chinese Air Force? Did, was there a presence of that? Did you see any no. of that at all? They, they were wiped out very quickly. And, and what about the Flying Tigers, AVG, when they came over? Were you, uh, did you hear about them? Did you know anything about yeah, them? Yeah, we, we heard about them. They they were operating uh, a bit south of us from Quinmin and so on. And uh, I can mention, I perhaps should mention, that uh, uh, with the fall of Singapore and the Japanese taking over, they pushed the British up this way, and there's one contingent of Brits who got trapped and they couldn't go into India. They had to come over what was left of the Burma Road into China. And they arrived, I guess, around 42, I think. It was quite a long trek for them and uh, it was very uh, very stressful. They were, they were basically marooned there. There weren't a huge number, there were a couple of hundred. But again, an interesting uh, story. Uh, this one Brit told me that uh, his uh, their truck had overturned. They were the Japanese in parts of the trip were only, you know, four or five miles down the road behind them. And uh, the truck overturned and his friend was pinned underneath it. And they couldn't free him. So his friend asked him to shoot him because he knew that if the Japanese came, what would happen to him. So he shot his friend and they continued on and arrived in Chengdu. And then <clears throat> um, there is... Uh, we heard a few things about the, the Flying Tigers, often through the BBC, because the only radio communication we had was shortwave radio. And uh, those days in 41, 42 were kind of desperate, because it looked like the Germans were winning everything, and the Japanese were winning everything. The two British uh, battleships had both been sunk, and uh, it, was, uh, it looked like they were going to go all the way right through, to, to, uh, right through India. And what's forgotten is that uh, there was, in India, there was a group of uh, people who actually were supporting the Japanese. Yes, right. And uh, it's sort of, it's not played to talk about it today, but I think even Gandhi had some, uh, in his group had some Japanese sympathizers. And uh, uh, Len Burchill, uh, he was Air Vice Marshal of the Canadian the RCAF, he's called the, the Savior of Ceylon because he was in a Catalina patrolling outside at that time he was flying, he spotted the Japanese fleet approaching Ceylon. And the idea was it was going to be another surprise attack like Pearl Harbor. And they could, if they could catch the British unprepared and with the two big British uh, battleships out of the way, they're, they're sunk, uh, they could take Ceylon and then they would have the tip of India and then they would they'd be in a position then to go up the Red Sea and go in behind the British in Egypt. And then uh, Rommel, North Africa, and the Japanese coming this way, they could join up. That was the grand plan. And he spotted them, but it's, of course, as soon as he broke air silence, the, the, the Japanese uh, sent up fire planes, and they shot the, the plane down. He spent the war in captivity. A remarkable man. He stood up for his troops. He was beaten by the Japanese. He was, but they, he was such a, a determined, a spunky individual basically he saved the lives of many of the, uh, the POWs and uh, he came back and had quite a distinguished career with the Canadian Air Force hmm. and uh, he's known as the savior of Ceylon and Churchill even mentioned that mm -hmm. one of the, the sort of keys to the Second World War that people don't know about was the fact that this chap Birchall <laughs> spotted the, the fleet and broke silence and uh, was able to alert the Brits so they were forewarned 
in Ceylon, and uh, it, otherwise Ceylon would probably have been captured. Um, so actually, actually Canada uh, got into the war in 39 probably, right. uh, and so was there any thought of you guys trying to get back to Canada? Or did anybody get out the, uh, from nope. your area, or were you just too far inland and no way to get, get uh, away? A few people had to sort of overstay. Uh, some of the people, when their seven years were up, were able to work down to Quimmin and then they'd fly out with the American Air Force uh, through Burma and India and go that way. A uh, fair number, some of the people left in 44, and that then the, the school basically was closed by that time, and there were about three or four of the wives then took over. I know my American history better than my Canadian history. Never like Canadian history. <laughs> it's not too, it's not exciting enough. <laughs> Whereas American history, there's all of this yeah, neat right. stuff. Yeah. So anyway, we had a uh, Mrs. Fenn uh, taught us. Uh, she was an American school teacher, and she taught us the history, which was American history. <laughs> and uh, it was it was funny uh, when I was writing the entrance exams to go to Royal Military College. Uh, <laughs> They asked me all these sort of geographical questions, where is this, where is that, and so on. You know all the answers. Until so I came over and they said, what's the capital of New Brunswick? This is a problem. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> I hadn't a clue. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but th that was... Uh, huh. Okay. Um, so, um, okay, well, let, let's continue on now. And you were mentioning that there eventually became an American presence in your area. Right. The... Uh, they started the uh, the GIs, the U.S. Air Force came in, I would say around 43, I think, 44. They just, people started arriving, and they started building these air bases around Chengdu, and then uh, I think they built seven of them, and they were for the B-29 bombers, and Doolittle had uh, bombed uh, uh, Japan, is that 44? No, that was 42, actually. It was 42. Off the aircraft okay. carrier. Okay, that's the, right. Went off the aircraft carrier. But they had that, no, that was the only time up yeah. for a couple so of years. So this would be about 43, I think. And it uh, took a while to construct them because they're all done by hand labor, if you can imagine. The stone and everything was, was packed down. And then more and more started to come in. And uh, they were a little disappointed being in China because the ones that they sent to Chengdu had fought through North Africa. So they already, right from 41, 42, they had already seen very active service. And all of a sudden, these guys from Ohio, you know, Texas, you name it, were instead of this godforsaken part of the earth, and they probably never even heard of before. And What was the climate like there? Hot. All the time, pretty Bloody much. Bloody hot, yeah. Hmm. It was uh, uh, summertime, we used to go up into the mountains, the, the women and children, they go up to the mountains to escape the malaria, because with all the rice fields and so on, there are an awful lot of mosquitoes, and there's no cure for malaria at that time. Do they but, have a rainy season? Um, the rainy, yes, the, it rained over the summer, mm -hmm. and uh, so it was. Uh, so we would go up in the mountains. I'll, I'll mention something uh, interesting, a little sidelight there later on. They built these bases and. Uh, the, we became fairly good friends with many of the Americans. It, we had them in for Christmas dinner and Thanksgiving, and of course the two Thanksgiving, Canadian Thanksgiving is a month before American Thanksgiving, or the Mayflower Thanksgiving. And uh, what day, when is the Canadian Thanksgiving? What, uh, you, end of October, no, yeah, end of September. Yeah, yeah for beginning, the end of, of uh, beginning of uh, October. I guess because winter comes a little earlier in Canada. <laughs> is it a certain day of the week or a certain date? Is it like uh, ours is the fourth th Thursday of November, I think? Uh, uh, how does yours work? It's at least a bit, it's the, the early in no, it's yeah. a Monday in October. I'm just trying to, I don't know the exact date. Probably the first, uh, first, Monday, first Monday in October. Monday in October. October. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And because we have our ex cadet get together the week before ca the Canadian Thanksgiving. Um, so anyway, uh, they built these bases, and we got to know a fair number of them, and uh, two of them in particular, uh, I can remember the name Danny Breslow, and a Wally Noblet. Wally Noblet stayed in the services after the war, he was a photographer, and he was at the atomic bomb tests uh, in the Pacific there, mm -hmm. and he sent us a short snorter from the, uh, 
<laughs> from that. And uh, they were wonderful, wonderful people. They, uh, of course, things were very tight, and they helped us out in many ways. My father had uh, appendicitis, and he was able to get uh, sulfonilamide, which had just come in, uh, uh, from them, which cured his appendicitis because it had burst, and he had a raging infection. But the sulfonilamide, he had an allergic reaction to it. Some people do, and that almost did him in too. And but they did surgery on him too. At the yeah, yeah, right. at the right. hospital there. They had, it was a good hospital for the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, but these drugs, you see, were not available. Right. So and uh, everything from K rations that they occasionally get rid of in exchange for a nice home cooked meal. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there were a number of. Uh, and of course, the, the candies that came in the key rations. And, uh, Did they have any fighter planes, or were they all B-29 bombers? They had, uh, <coughs> they had P-47s mm -hmm. they brought in. And I can even remember the first line of the song I learned. It goes, oh, the Mohawks, Tomahawks, Kitty Hawks, Warhawks, roaring through the air, but what we want the most of all are brand new 51s. Uh -huh. And I don't know the rest of it. I just remember that line. Uh -huh. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> and because there were uh, P-40s that they used in North Africa. Right. Basically, so they had been hoping for P-51s, and they're, they're quite disappointed. But then they they grew to love those uh, Thunderbolts and uh, big cigars, and uh, they because they were almost indestructible. Yeah. And they they would accompany the B-29s a good part of the journey. But I it was 3,000 miles I think there in return. It was a huge journey, and uh, the uh, poor pilots. It was very very stressful because. I can remember them telling me on quite a few occasions that they came back the last, you know, 15, 20 minutes, and then every fuel gauge was reading empty. Because that was that it started out. I don't know whether they used wing tanks, but they crammed as much gas as they could get yeah. on those B-29s. Let's, let's take a look. We got a B-29 over here, just to kind of so people know what kind of plane we're talking about here. Yeah, it's a beautiful plane. It was a Super Fortress. Um, Boeing, and, uh, who had built the B-17 before that, so this is, but it had a much bigger range and a bigger pay payload, I believe, right. and a large, a quite a, a bit larger plane, too. Yeah. So you saw quite a few of those, huh? Yeah, we saw those taking off and landing, and uh, I was invited out to the, the base. I, uh, I spent, I think, a weekend out there. They said, you know, you come out. So uh, out I went, and I still don't like uh, eggs sunny side up. Because they hardly cooked them, oh, yeah. <laughs> and that was my first taste of eggs sunny side up. So uh, scrambled a great, you know, flip them over. <laughs> but uh, sunny side up, I still can't uh, stand. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I remember the, I went out to look at the uh, P-47s. I think that's where my mm -hmm. love of flying originated. Uh -huh. And uh, I could, again, it was sort of funny. I was there's this tube hanging down, and I was wondering if I said, you know, you could blow through it right into the cockpit. And I said, what is this for? You know, and the guys were killing themselves laughing. And of course, on a long trip, oh. if you had to relieve yourself, yeah. they had this little device that you could use and then you could pee out of it. And of course, this is what I was uh, I was shouting into. And yeah. of course, I was 11 years old, you know, 12 right. years old. But, uh, uh, how far was the base away from your home? I'd say about 10 miles. Okay. Did you ever see planes come back shot up or anything like that? Uh, they'd go over our house shot up, but I, I don't recall being there when they landed. But, yeah, but I mean, you, you could you yeah. could, could yeah. you sometimes see that... And and, and occasionally come. we'd have a group of P of, of uh, the airmen in, and, uh, you know, and somebody would be missing from the next group. And of course it was rather uh, hazardous uh, for them because a lot of it was uh, occupied territory and the Japanese were were not pleasant at all, put it mildly, and uh, if they were captured going over that, and of course... How, how close did the Japanese lines ever get to uh, your place? Uh, they came, I would say, three to five hundred miles, and that was near the end of the war when the Japanese were trying to conquer as much of China as possible to see if they could get the best, most favorable treaty terms, not realizing that the Allies had the Americans of the atomic bomb, which was a wonderful, it saved thousands of lives, maybe millions. I think I, I think so, both Japanese and American are yeah. allied, you know, for sure. 
Um, so, um, you, were you kept abreast of what was happening with the war throughout the, the world and things like that? I mean, did you, I suppose you had radio and it was, uh, it was news, way, newspapers too, or, or were there? No, there are no newspapers. Uh, uh, once the, uh, the troops arrived, the airmen arrived, then of course we would get more news and better news. Mm -hmm. And uh, even had a USO troop there. I remember seeing yeah. a performance. Oh. Which, you know, I, I wish I could remember their names and give them credit, but yeah. there was uh, somebody who sang, and there's one girl who's a contortionist, <laughs> and uh, she could do amazing things. And uh, I remember her telling me that she had to do it every day or else <laughs> she'd tighten up. Yeah, that's <laughs> like the yoga classes, I think. <laughs> no, that's what our guy tells us the same thing. Yeah, she's very pretty, too. <laughs> uh, so. You, when did you really start feeling pretty good about the way things were going with the war? I think after the uh, the uh, USAF arrived in uh, in Chengdu, things seemed to be improving, and and we of course were getting more news, and things were improving uh, in the uh, the Pacific, which we would hear, and uh, things were on, more on a positive mm -hmm. uh, on a positive note. Do you remember when you first heard about the atomic bomb being dropped? And we were back in, uh, let me see now, we were back in uh, North America then. Oh, you were? Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, I'll just... Uh, well, let's, let's back up then to okay. let's talk about how, when do you went back and how that came about and stuff. All right. Uh, it, was in, it would be in 44. We, we went from the Chengdu up to a place called Beilo Din, which is in the mountains. Uh, for the summer, and I just recently found this out that Dick Wilmot, who was with me, he was about uh, four, four years, I'd be 12, 16, he'd only be 17 or 18, but he spoke impeccable Chinese, and he volunteered for the uh, OAS, mm -hmm. I think is the correct word, and OSS, uh, maybe, OSS, 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 intelligence, yeah, and uh, he was, uh, so, because he could speak uh, perfect Chinese, so he was, if they had to interrogate somebody or, or anything like this or talk to somebody or get something across, he could translate and, and besides he's, he was a, a very uh, uh, smart person, he wound up being a professor at university and I think he was in, yeah, in, uh, not psychology, uh, uh, that will come, well one of the related areas like that. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, he told me an interesting thing I hadn't realized, this was just this last October, the China reunion, that in, when he was in the uh, Secret Service, they were, at first they were, they shared everything with the Chinese, the Chinese Secret Service and the American. Then they realized that on certain missions, the Japanese were being forewarned. So some, uh, there was uh, some stool pigeon, some stinker in there, who was passing it on, either for financial gain or for whatever reason. So they formed a second one, which was completely secure. It was only U.S. And so they had this other one, which talked with the Chinese and so on, basically played the Chinese game. <laughs> and this other one, which is a completely separate unit, and nothing went from it to the other one. <laughs> and then that way they were able to, any missions or anything that might be happening that was, that was uh, secure, was, Stay yeah. safe. Maybe they maybe even use that guy for decoy too, and would feed him information that yeah. wasn't at him. Right. Um, yeah. So, oh, you were uh, a while ago. You, you were talking about. We were just talking about. Sometimes you went up into the mountains, and you said, as an aside to that, you were going to tell us a little bit later. Oh, uh, well, it's uh, again. Uh, I, I going up into the mountains. Uh, the troops had to carry their, their, their arms with them, of course. And uh, so I, I offered to carry this guy's M1. <laughs> oh, was I ever proud. I, I think I carried the whole trip for this guy. Of course, he's, uh, he, instead of dragging it around you know, after all these years of, of carrying it, he was glad to get, it, get rid and, and have a, 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 a North American coolie carry it for him. <laughs> so uh, I'm still... I'm looking to to, uh, to find an M1 that I can, can buy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether my wife's in completely in agreement with this, but uh, yeah. so uh, that that was kind of humor. So we we were up in the mountains for the summer, and then came back down. That would be in '44, and 
let me think, make sure. Uh, in 45, things started to get pretty desperate for Japan, and they put on this great big huge push and to conquer as much land as I mentioned. And they felt at that time that all the civilians should be evacuated on the area in case the Japanese came in. So in 45, we were evacuated from Chengdu to Chongqing. And uh, I can still remember my father making the round of the embassies trying to get his, his visa stamped to leave China and go, go to India. And to this day, I still have a, a dislike of bureaucracy. <laughs> all these people, you know, all you need is that one stamp and yeah. you can't get it. But we flew over the hump. Good mm -hmm. flight. Mm -hmm. And what quite amazing. What were you on? C-47. And of course the mountains were towering above us and you had to fly in between and those, those guys could fly. And uh, we landed in uh, Burma somewhere and then we flew from there into Calcutta and then we took the train from Calcutta to uh, New Delhi and I then attended the American school it was called. It's like the Canadian school, they used the Canadian curriculum, this is the American school in Missouri, India and it was quite a size, maybe 600, 700 uh, kids there. And we followed the an American curriculum, and I was there for a while. And then when the an opening came on the refugee ship, it was called the, the Gripsholm, it's a Swedish uh, ship. And I think it's still on the oceans today. It's just a uh, tourist, goes it smaller, and then goes places that some of the big ones won't go. Mm -hmm. And uh, we came back to uh, North America through the, up the Red Sea and then through the Mediterranean, Gibraltar. And, we stopped at Athens for overnight, and a Greek gentleman got on board the ship, and he gave me two million drachmas. And of course, before the war, that would have made me wealthy, but <laughs> at that time, with inflation in Greece, it was worth nothing. And I still have one million five hundred thousand drachmas because I traded five hundred dra five hundred thousand drachmas to some other kid for something I forget what. <laughs> anyway, so we arrived in New York City, and. I, I polished shoes on the, on the boat to earn money to, uh, and as soon as we got to New York, I bought myself a model airplane kit that I spent time in the hotel room putting together. Mm. Do you remember what kind of plane it was? Uh, no, it was a fighter of some type. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And uh, probably may have been a P-51. <laughs> and then did you go to Canada? Yeah, then we went up to Toronto. Okay. Um, so. And did you ever go back to China after that? No, it's, uh, for a while there was the, the problem of having been born there, that if I ever returned up until a few years ago, there was a, there was a slight possibility that they might not let you leave. Mm -hmm. So there, there was that, and uh, just uh, with a family and so on like that to just pull yourself yeah. away for, for a length of time and uh, take off is, is not quite as easy. So what did your dad do when he got back to Toronto then? He was at the University of Toronto for a couple of years, and he would like to have gone back to teaching at the university, but the veterans the refer had, uh, had uh, DVA uh, funding and so on for going to university. It sort of uh, got, died down, so the university was actually cutting back. So there were no jobs in teaching chemistry at the university in Canada. So he went back to uh, the aluminum company that he had worked with briefly. He graduated in... Uh, 1927, 27, 29. He graduated in 29 from university, and he worked for a few years before he went to China. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he went back to the, the Lunar Research Labs in Kingston, Ontario, where he was head of the uh, chemistry section. Okay. Yeah. So that's where you lived most of the time when you were growing up. Yeah. Did you were you about in high school when you got back there, or? Were you uh, about ready to start that? I, I arrived back in grade seven and eight, okay. or on this side, and I was a weird-looking sight because I was wearing shorts. And of course, in those days, nobody wore shorts. No boy, yeah. self-respecting boy, wore yeah. shorts. Yeah. And uh, I had red uh, glasses, and courtesy of the USAF, because they took my prescription, and they it was fulfilled, I think, in California, and then they flew it back with some uh, personal mail through India, then over the hump to, to Chengdu. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, those were my first pair of glasses, and as I say, th th those guys were really great. You know, I have a real 
warm spot in my heart for them all. And uh, they, uh, so I arrived at school <laughs> looking like a complete nerd. <laughs> and uh, I had two fights. Uh, the first one I won and the second one was a draw and after that they, <laughs> they, 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 they left me alone. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so did you have any kind of an accent? I mean, is there such a, a Chinese accent? Or uh, I, I think by, no, I, I didn't. Yeah. It, uh, being, the school was English speaking. Yeah, right. So, so once I, I started school, there was no... Uh, now, so where your dad, what'd you say, Kingston, Ontario? Is Kingston, that, Ontario. How big a place is that? It's around 160,000. 60, Queen's yeah. University is there. It's, oh. it's very well known. And uh, the Royal Military College of Canada is there. Yeah. And uh, it's sort of Canada's West Point. Yeah, right. And so but you went to, where'd you go to high school then? I went to uh, Kingston Collegiate there. Okay. And Did you play uh, sports and And I uh, played basketball. In high school, often the taller guys are a little bit lanky and they aren't as well coordinated as us shorter guys. Mm -hmm. So I was able to, and I had a, a really wicked pair of elbows too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I played basketball and track and field. I didn't play football because I would take my glasses off. I, I'd be running down, and, where's that ball? <laughs> I, I couldn't uh, see it, so I. Yeah. And now the weather is, uh, the climate is quite markedly different than what you were used to. How did you adjust to that? Uh, fairly well. I, I took up skiing mm -hmm. and I, I never learned to skate because it's best I started at a young age and by that time it was, I was just so far behind. So uh, I love hockey. I've coached hockey. But I coached hockey in a pair of galoshes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and not on a pair of skates like you should. <laughs> and actually uh, the team I coached did very well. They got to the finals. We now you're interested in aviation, probably even in yes. high school. Did you? Uh, well, of course, you've been in planes before, you know, in China and coming over here. Had uh, did you go up in, in uh, Canada? Did you get the, uh, we had a, uh, a cadet corps at the high school, and I was in that. Oh, uh -huh. And uh, so I was in that for uh, f uh, five years. High school ran in those days five years in uh -huh. Ontario, and uh, oh. I forget what rank it was, I think it was command of the platoon. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so was that uh, helpful in getting into the uh, in military college? Military college? I, I think so, a bit. Mm -hmm. And how do you get, is it like here where you're appointed by someone to go there? Um, I don't, uh, here you, you know, you, you, have you to get find a senator somebody, or, uh, somebody do that. To, yeah. uh, no, it's, uh, you, you apply directly to the armed forces and they, there's the interviews and in our in my day, you wrote exams. So you wrote exams in mathematics and science, mm -hmm. and I don't know if they included English or not. And uh, and you wrote exams, and if you did well in those exams, you, you could even, based on that, and there's another interview to make sure that you had the right personality, because it's it's not the usual course of, of things. You <laughs> it, There's quite a, uh, in, in our day, there's quite a, hazing ritual, I guess you'd call it. Yeah. It wasn't terrible, but yeah, I can remember doing on a, on a Saturday in my day off, you know, running circles, <laughs> and you might have, for, you know, if your uniform wasn't quite as neat as it might be, you'd have to run circles, and so you... When, you know, when did you first decide that you were going to apply to the academy? I think it was my final year of high school. And, uh, and what prompted you to? Well, I, I think adventure. Uh, there was uh, the idea of being able to be in the Air Force was very appealing, and of course I hoped I might, I knew I couldn't make pilot, but I, I hoped I might make navigator or flight engineer. But by this time you knew that uh, yeah. your eyesight yeah. would not. Would but I, I squinted as hard as I could, <laughs> <laughs> but I still didn't make it. Usually it seems like it's the color, guys that are colorblind that yeah. uh, don't get a chance. Yeah. Well nowadays you could go to a, get your eyes laser treated and, sure. and you'd, I would have made it. Yeah. I'm going to uh, change tape here right now. You guys doing okay? Sure. Okay. There was one other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, cups and... Uh, airmen from Texas. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The veteran.
There was something you wanted to bring up just now? <laughs> yeah, I'll screw that, Rosie. <laughs> When I when I met my husband, yeah, I was going to ask you when did have you met each other by this time or not? In '55. Okay, yeah. so you that was during when he was at uh, the Royal Military yeah. College and I was in nursing at the hospital. Oh, okay. Yeah. Seven of my compatriots need blind dates, <laughs> so I said, "Hey, Spooner, hey, you live in Kingston. Get us some <laughs> some blind dates." So that's so. how seven yeah. nurses and seven uh, okay. cadets. Uh, yeah, but uh, from the time that I met my husband David uh, and the family, this China connection was so very obvious. I mean, they were there. The closest friends the family had were the China people. Well, they'd all lived on the campus together and gone through all of this together. I never heard them talk of fear or anxiety or uh, that sort of thing, and I was just amazed because they'd gone through these war years and uh, I could see what strength David's mother had had uh, in certain situations not that his father didn't but I mean she was an extremely strong woman but they didn't they didn't talk about the uh, anxiety and fear they talked about the good times and the comradeship and these all these close connections and uh, we have so many photos so many photos of China and I was really so impressed with the photos of the young airmen in their home in China, around the dinner table and the pianos there, and you can just see it's Christmas time, you know, these young uh, fellows. And then about it must be about three or four years ago, we got a call from his from David's um, aunt, an aunt by marriage, to say that she'd had a phone call. And this is the story: there's a um, an uh, retired uh, veteran, an airman, living in Texas. And he had these, he'd been going through his uh, possessions, and he came upon a photo of a David Spooner and Playmate on the roadside in China. Oh my gosh. So he went on the internet and he looked up all the Spooners in Canada. Now he may have even known they were from Ontario, I don't know. And he came up with Aunt Dorothy in Toronto, phoned her because he wanted to mail back the picture of this kid. And that must have been 60 years yeah. later, the picture of the kid that he'd taken That's in China. Amazing. And uh, I will never forget that. Uh, By the way, we will transcribe this and put it in print form. And what I'd like for you to do is, if you wouldn't mind, some of these photographs that you're talking about, if you can make copies and, and mail to me, then we'll add that to your, Certainly. To your yeah. story. Yeah. If you had them here, I'd just make copies here, but I doubt that you do. So, but if you love to have copies of them, yeah. Oh, I, I phoned the gentleman in Texas and we had a very nice conversation and it turns out we had very similar careers. Of course, he was 10 years older than I am and uh, he taught at a college in, in Texas somewhere. I should have brought him his uh, name and address along if I can find it. And uh, I wound up teaching at junior college. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it's uh, very, <laughs> very interesting that, that respect. Well, Rose, uh, let's talk about you a little bit. What was your maiden name? Gardner. Gardner. And where, how about your ancestors? Where did everybody come from? My mother was French Canadian. She would prefer to, to a, that I would say she was from France, <laughs> which of course they were originally. What was her, what was her maiden name? Bobian. And they, I, I they came B E A U B I E N, oh. and they arrived in Sorel, Quebec, from okay. France. Okay. Uh, and my father was Scotch. Okay. Uh, ancestry there was from Scotland. Yeah. And you grew up where? Well, we moved around in Ontario quite a bit. Huntsville, which is north of Toronto, uh, was where I went mainly to public school and um, in the Ottawa Valley for high school. I'm proud. And what did your dad do? He managed a store. He was in store business. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so had you always been interested in nursing? Or yes. Not? Very definitely. Now, do you remember much about World War II when you were a kid? I remember being in New Liskard at the end of the war at Northern Ontario, and I remember all the ticker tapes coming down. Oh, yeah, and earlier when I was a kid, I remember the war saving stamps, yes. and I'd get my allowance, and there'd be so much for me and so much for the war saving stamps. <laughs> uh -huh. I remember the rat. I was just looking in the museum here, and I think you had the same things. Uh, I saw the um, food. Uh, Coupons, coupons right. and they used we used 
my mother used to trade to get some sugar for preserving right. and, and that mm -hmm. sort of, oh I remember very vividly and my father regretted so much that due to his health he could not enlist mm -hmm. so he was in the sea cadets an officer in the sea cadets oh. and I remember the young fellows in this very small town we lived in uh, when they would uh, he would be working with them in training and then they'd go off to war and uh, I remember the war mm -hmm. very very vividly remember them going and who didn't come back and mm -hmm. yeah and when did you become interested in nursing oh very early on i suppose in high school mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the first doll <laughs> hey, that's what i was just gonna say <laughs> and uh, uh so where did you go to nursing school at the hotel du hospital in kingston and the university of toronto okay so you uh, you were both of you in school when you first met yes yeah. okay and uh, tell me a little bit about uh, how uh, how many in your class at uh, the, the uh, uh, military college? I think we started out with about 160, 150, something like that. I'm not sure. I can and we had uh, our classmen very strong. We had a senior class that were very mean to us. And <laughs> what it did was it bonded us all yeah. tremendously because we put up with so much shit. <laughs> to pardon the language, but uh, did you were you called plebes and stuff like? Uh, uh, no, we were called juniors. Juniors, yeah. Yeah. junior, come here. <laughs> and uh, it, and being, it was a four-year. Uh, it was four years, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was though the Navy they didn't believe in education was, was necessary, so the Navy people often left after two, they left after two years. They just did two years. Oh, I see. And Royal Roads is first the uh, the Royal Naval College. And then it became tri-service, and which meant the Air Force and Army were welcome there too. And uh, so uh, it was only two years. It was, and the idea was Canada it was like the states being so wide. If you have a kid on the West Coast uh, to go all the way across, let's say to New York State, let's say uh, somebody from California, yeah. from high school, you know, he'd say, "Well, gee, I can go just down the road to Caltech, or I can go somewhere like this." Or even go up to Washington. I don't have to, you know, travel to get an education to go that far. So they established these sort of satellite, uh, two satellite colleges. One was College Militaire Royale de Saint Jean, and it is in Quebec, and it was French speaking, and they had a sort of a, fir a preliminary year, and then two more years. And Royal Roads was English speaking; it was two years. The idea was that kids could sort of go to the local one, and then they transfer to RMC. Well. Um, the academic professors got great ideas, and they, they kept trying to increase the number of programs. Of course, the cost went up tremendously, and so what is, so basically, the Royal Roads was closed a few years back, and CMR is still running, but in a different capacity now. So uh, the first year, you were a junior, and you got pushed around. Mm -hmm. around uh, well, I almost have to use swear words, too, but anyway, you, you, you learned respect <laughs> for your elders. <laughs> and anyway, which isn't such a bad thing. And not only that, there's a good bonding process. So we started out with 140 to 160, I think. A fair number didn't make it through the first year. And then we uh, lost some more to the Navy after the two years. And some people after their two years, because we were a reserve at that time, this was a difference. Everybody joined as a, in, as a reservist. And then they brought in a, uh, what they call a regular officer training program, whereby you could then go regular, and then you got paid, and you were wealthy. <laughs> I stayed reserved because I wasn't getting the, uh, the pilot <laughs> training that I, right. I had sort of hoped for. Yeah. So I stayed reserved. Okay. And uh, uh, so I didn't serve with the, uh, the regular force afterwards. But... We stayed together as a group, but our reunion we had something like uh, close to 90. Oh, yes. Nine, 90 of us yeah. returned. And before. many of these, uh, of his classmates, um, met and married women who knew each other. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very cohesive group. I meant group. to ask you, too, uh, a lot of the people that you were with in China, did they come back to, I mean, did you have any neighbors that you were with over there? No. But you've had contact, because you've talked about, you've had contact with yes. the, over the years. with. There's with uh, Dr. Lewis Walmsley, who is the first professor of Oriental Studies at the University of Toronto. He's a very 
was one of these polymath type people. He was good at everything. He painted beautifully. He, he was a scholar. He was a PhD. He was, uh, and he ran the school as well as a very uh, humane person. And uh, they sort of, he sort of had a, a, a reunion of the school. So ever since the 40s, they've been meeting once a year, the week after Thanksgiving, Canadian Thanksgiving, and having a uh, get together. So they have a big Chinese meal and they sing the old school song. <laughs> if you can remember your Chinese, you sing it in Chinese. <laughs> and, uh, and you uh, exchange and meet people. Not yeah. everybody's there all the time, but uh -huh. uh, there, there are people who finished. Uh, there are a fair number of war veterans in the group. Uh, as I said, Dick Wilmot served in the, the armed forces uh, in China and then when he came here, he went through on DVA and. Uh, that chap lives north of Kingston. Um, oh, they make, the, they do the cooking, the bells. Yeah, I know. They, mm -hmm. uh, he served in the Canadian Armed Forces, and uh, um, Omer Wam, uh, Omer, uh, one, of Clay, the Wams. Uh, one of the Wams. He's a, he's a, a medical doctor. He uh, he did his medical training after the war. He served in the Second World War. Then he became, then he did his. Bob Kilburn, sorry, Bob Kilburn, mm -hmm. and so he served a, uh, he got his MD afterwards, and uh, so there's uh, a fair number of the, the, the Mish kids, as they, they, as they call themselves, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, served in the armed forces, those who are the right age. But because we lived in Kingston, and so did David's parents, we resettled back to Kingston in 66, so we were right there, and as when these people would come to visit, his parents' generation would come yeah. to visit and so on. There, we reconnected. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so what year did you graduate from uh, military school then? I graduated from Rhodes in 54 and I graduated from Queens in 1956. Okay, and um, now the Korean War was kind of going on when you, probably for that first couple of years. Mm -hmm. were, were, I can't remember, were the Canadians involved in that? Yeah, they had a, a huge contingent over there. Did you have any thoughts of, of that you might be uh, sent over there? Yeah, we can. I remember uh, in our first year, Admiral Pullen, a very ch charismatic uh, chap with the Navy, spoke to us about the Korean War, and uh, I think after his speech, we we all got up and followed him uh, <laughs> out of the uh, out of the, the, the mess hall, yeah. and uh, and gone right then and there. Yeah. But he was just warning. He was telling people about what was at stake, yeah. and uh, there was. Of course, the Cold War was raging, and things were were, were pretty uh, tricky uh, overall. I think you know things could have tilted either way. Did you uh, when you were in Canada? Did you follow what was going on in China, probably more so than the average Westerner yes. would? A uh, number of uh, the uh, people who worked there. There's a doctor, Mary Manley, uh, a very gifted medical doctor, and she went back. And uh, uh, it was quite devastating because when the, uh, the Red Guards took over, uh, she had spent her entire life in China. Uh, probably she didn't marry because of this. It's, you know, it's very hard to find a suitable husband if you're all by, alone by yourself in the hills somewhere, you know, delivering babies and uh, doing family medicine. To, uh, and uh, just a wonderful person. And... Uh, they, she was paraded through the streets and they threw refuse and garbage at her with a big placard around her. I think it, it broke her in a way. In other words, she had served to the best of her ability. And, uh, you know, this was the, the, the thank you. And there were a number of other people. This is about 1948, 49, I think. And uh, so there was this sort of connection. You, you heard what was going on and... Uh, the, uh, there was a bit of a division among some of the missionaries. Um, uh, some of the missionaries had, had uh, sort of, uh, because of the corruption in the, in the, the Guaymindong and with and John Kai shek as I said, he got, I think he lost his footing, got pushed in on the warlords. That's one way of looking at it. Other people might disagree with me. But then he, he got separated from the people. And once the, the, the leader gets, loses that base support, it's hard then. But anyway, uh, so uh, because of the corruption and everything that was going on, 
uh, many people sort of said, well, the communists couldn't be any worse. And uh, there was, so there were some people who, uh, they weren't communists, but they, they sort of were supporting the communist group. What, by Westerners you're talking by about? By Westerners, yes, oh, okay. these new missionaries. And uh, this was a little disturbing to some of the other people who, who were not as persuaded that the communists were, were as wonderful as some people were making them out to be in those days. And uh, so, uh, so there's a little bit of a division there, but it's, it's, it's all past now. What do you see in the future for China? I think we need to be very careful. Uh, I can remember that the Japanese uh, warships and their planes, and there's a little statistic somewhere that they, they, they got 87% of their iron from the USA. And basically, uh, China is trying to buy up some of uh, the natural resources on this side of the, uh, the Pacific. And we, we could be in a situation where, you know, 20 years down the road, uh, it, it could be a, a case if hostilities break out, how many light bulbs are made in North America anymore? I heard at one time there's one factory left. Um, you know, the new fluorescent ones. Uh, you can just name item after item that we no longer make. And uh, I'm not sure exactly where I picked this up from, but I heard that one of the uh, things during the Second World War was that if a, a tank broke down in the middle of the desert, the average Canadian not the Brits so much, but the average Canadian or American could go in there and could probably fix it or see what was wrong and know what to do. Because we, we all grew up with, it came from farms, we had machinery which you repaired yourself and did, and we no longer have that ability. The average American or Canadian wouldn't, wouldn't know what the hell to do. And I, there were planes flying out of uh, the Philippines. And I think one, the one wing was from a, oh, a P-40, the other wing, was a, uh, from some other plane, maybe a P-38 or something like that. It yeah, flew, right. and yeah. you, you know Just more made, stories like this. Do. But right. the, the mechanics are good enough that they could put it together and the damn thing flew. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think we need to be very, very careful. And we need to be, uh, North America, we need to be self-sufficient because the, the Chinese, uh, just a little story here, when the missionaries arrived in China, the Chinese, many of them, uh, of course, you're there, you're, there's this beautiful Chinese girl, you fall in love, you like to get married. And it, it was frowned upon by the Chinese. You're not going to marry below your stature. Now, we're perhaps not used to, to thinking of that, because we've been sort of top dogs over here. And if they, the lighter your skin, <laughs> the better it is, sort of thing. And then there's still a great deal of discrimination, which is unfair, but it, you, you can see how it sort of naturally happens. But in China, they, they have a, uh, an extremely uh, powerful conviction and uh, a certainty. And I used to, uh, I'll use this as an example too, I, uh, IQ is distribu distributed evenly. So if Canada's got a population of 30 million, and 1% are good at math, and you got 1% of 30 million. If China has a population <laughs> of uh, uh, one and a half billion, two billion, and one percent are mathematically talented. How many mathematicians do they have as compared to Canada, or the states for that matter? Yeah, yeah. And it's just a matter of, of numbers. And uh, they are, uh, having taught mathematics, uh, I've done a fair amount of reading about this, and it's, it's interesting, the, the comments, that if a Chinese student or isn't good at mathematics, he, he will say, I'm not very good at mathematics right now, but I've got to work harder. Whereas in North America, the kid will say, I'm not good at mathematics, I guess I'll take something else. I'm, uh, I'm, I was born that way. So people use this as an excuse that you're either born and not realize that 90% of anything is, is uh, application and, and hard work. Right. Yeah. 90% uh, perspiration, 10% <laughs> inspiration, right. something like that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. uh, mm -hmm. I, I think I think we need to be very very careful, and I, you know, God give us good leadership, because as we were, heaven knows we're going to need it. Yeah. Okay, now uh, going back uh, when you graduated, now did you guys get married then, or were you married by this time, or what? No, we were married in '58. Okay. 
58. 58, yeah. Okay, so, but you were going together at that yeah. time? Yeah. Oh. yeah. From... She had a blind date with somebody else <laughs> at the thing, and <laughs> I was with somebody else, and... Uh, I, I decided... From 1955. I, yeah. Okay. So I, I decided that that was the girl I would prefer to be with, so <laughs> I cut out the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so what did you do then after you graduated? Uh, I worked as a financial analyst for Prudential America for three years. And then they were making noises about I'd have to go to head office in Newark, New Jersey. And I was not keen for what the Americans who had escaped from New York, New Jersey to come to Toronto were very, very happy people. Mm -hmm. So I uh, decided that, that was not the career path I wished to take. So I, I went in and got my teacher education and so on like that. Where did you go to school for that? I went to the University of Toronto. Okay. For how long? It was one year. Uh -huh. Basically made up of summers put together. Okay. And then I did a, a master's. And when did you graduate from nursing school? 55, and I worked for two years, and then I went to the University of Toronto mm -hmm. and uh, ended up in public health, oh. studied public health. And I worked for 25 years in Kingston with the health unit. Okay. She wound up as chairman of the division. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or chairwoman, <laughs> I should say, or chairperson, <laughs> be politically <laughs> correct. Um, and... Um, so you got married in when? 58. And children? Three. Okay, 59, 61, and 63. And what are their names? Three in less than four years. Mm -hmm. David, Ian, and Karen Lee. Okay, and uh, where, where do they all live? Uh, David, the oldest one, is an accountant in Ottawa. And Ian is a professor at Acadia University in Nova Scotia, Wolfville, Nova Scotia. Karen Lee is a teacher outside Oshawa, Ontario. And um, so, did you live? Well, okay, where did you live then, most all the time, or when you after you got married? We went to Toronto for a short time for three years, three or four years, and then we moved to Arnprior in the Ottawa Valley, short period of time. Back to Toronto, decided we definitely did not want to stay in Toronto with kids, so we left and went to Kingston. And uh, did you build a house there, or did you buy a house or, or in Kingston? Yeah. Yeah, we bought a house, and then uh, about 18 years ago, we built a house on the shores of Lake Ontario. Oh, yeah. Where was the house? Uh, do you remember the address of the house that you first Oh, in bought? Kingston? Uh -huh. Oh, yes, 104 Cliff Crescent. And that's where we raised the children, and uh, it's an excellent location, right adjacent to old Kingston, right, you know, part of the core. Uh, the city, but then we had this opportunity to build uh, downtown in the university area on Lake Ontario. Oh, on uh, Lake. Yeah. Uh, so Kingston's on Lake Ontario. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, and what's the history of? It sounds like it's a fairly old uh, uh, town. Uh, uh, it's, one yeah, it's one of the oldest cities locations in Canada. Uh, Count Frontenac in the 1700s established it there, and it's right at the junction of. Um, a, a stream that comes down the Rideau that comes down and it's the Lake Ontario empties into the St. Lawrence at this point. Mm -hmm. So you had uh, well, the Cayuga uh, on the American side and the Mohawk and the Iroquois mm -hmm. all came here and on the and you had Ojibwe on the north side so it was a great uh, center for meeting and being on water. Transportation mm -hmm. was very, very easy. So I guess from very early days it's been a, uh, there's been a settlement there and luckily for us it's when development took place in the 50s and 60s it went on in Toronto, Montreal and Ottawa and Kingston got left alone so it's basically the downtown section is still the same as it was in the 1800s which is really nice because a, a real sense of character and now people appreciate older yeah. styles. And yeah and they keep it yeah, yeah, and looking right. nice and stuff. And we were fortunate to be able to buy a lot that was uh, mm -hmm. uh -huh. the side lawn of one of the old homes. Uh, the big old homes. Uh, uh, and then we <laughs> were able to build right there. Oh, nice, yeah. Um, Indians, do they have Indian reservations like they have here? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, there's the uh, Taing Tyanganaga, <laughs> try to pronounce it. They're, just, they're about uh, 10 miles away, 15 miles away on the way to... Uh, Toronto. 
Indians. Yeah, yeah, they all have. Re they didn't really assimilate Indians into their culture. They so better much. now. There still is is a bit of a problem. They're Mohawk, and uh, basically they're loyalist Indians. What happened was after the Revolutionary War, the Indians, many of them, fought on the British side. So many of them then came north to Canada, and they were given land there and around where my mother lived, down near uh, in Caledonia. And uh, so there's, uh, there's quite an enclave of uh, Mohawks and Iroquois uh, in, in those areas. And uh, they're, uh, they, had, they were more, it's, it's hard to say it, with, I don't want to put anybody down, but the Mohawk and the Iroquois, the Iroquois nation, were very, very highly advanced. They they were close to having their own lang their own right written language. They they farmed. They they had a very intricate system of government, and uh, so they many of them have been able to make the transition to a to a Western culture more yeah. easily mm -hmm. than some of the uh, Plains Indians or yeah. some of the Indians in the north of Canada, where they had horrible problems trying to. To make that jump from Stone Age to Atomic Age, uh, which would be hard for anybody, and uh, so uh, they, the Indians they, in Desert are generally quite well off. And uh, I had, uh, because of my work in public health, I have met a lawyer who was raised there on the reservation. Mm -hmm. So they have done quite well. Well, tell me a little bit about your career. Are you still teaching? Uh, no, I, I retired back in '94, I think it was. Okay. I had 35 years in, and so I. And you taught this mathematics in, in college. Uh, yeah, junior college. It basically, what would be junior college or fifth form, as it's called. Uh -huh. The senior year. The senior mathematics. The senior mathematics yeah. in high school. Oh, is because it was five it was, years. Oh, I see. Yeah. They still have that five-year high school. Uh, they've. They've chopped a year off, and it, they're having some problems because basically, uh, in Canada, you can do a BA in three years, not four, because you have the, the that first year is is often given grade in the, thirteen was eighth grade, grade the, first the thirteenth year, year oh. or our senior matriculation year, as it used to, as it's sometimes called. So I, I taught that I was head of the math department in a number did of high schools. Did, did you see? Um, was it much different teaching uh, towards the end as towards the beginning as far as students, uh, how, you know, how they applied themselves or whatever? Or uh, math, <laughs> I think math is respected. So I had a much easier job letting the students know the value of it. And it's, it's a prerequisite for so many areas. Mm -hmm. And I think also due to my experience at military college, and being with the armed forces and so on, and you, you unfortunately in math you sometimes get uh, people who are too nerdy, and they can't relate to the average student. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I coached in a high school. I uh, I ran the, uh, the the ski team, and I did some track and field. I could catch. I had an Ontario champion actually. He went to an American University on a scholarship. Wonderful uh, distant runner, and so. I, I did a number of things other than just, just mathematics, yeah. and uh, we won quite a few local championships, uh, Eastern Ontario championships and so on, the, the ski teams, and uh, so there, there's a, a connection there with the student, and I also was able to bring in examples from navigation, for instance, I sail as well, we, we, oh. I sail on Lake Ontario, mm -hmm. from navigation and uh, airplane navigation. Uh, the, other applications where things like this can be useful, or even from work, my work at Prudential Life Insurance Company with mortgages, and with some of the classes, uh, depending, <laughs> we would do a, a study on uh, the advantages of paying your mortgage off earlier rather than later, and you know what happens with a 40-year mortgage? You know, basically all you're paying for years is interest. Yes. You know, it's, it's the stupidest thing that anybody could do. <laughs> and do you, and also, uh, but. but can you write off your, your mortgage payments in Canada? No, you can't. No. See, 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 here it's a little different because yeah, you do you get that benefit. <laughs> Those big, yeah. <laughs> it's like having a rental house where you can write off the costs yeah. uh, of that rental apartment building or whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. 
But as a school nurse, I did notice a difference in the high schools, in the students' behavior and so on. I can't speak for in the classroom, compared to those early, early years. Yeah. And I was smiling because I remember when we were first married and we would, or when you first went into teaching, and we would go out to the dances. I mean, that was a, a, e a really nice evening out to go to the high school dances. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly weren't going to the high school dances 20 years later. Uh, so the, yeah. the attitude within the school population, I not would, in the upper yeah. year, the well, I, years that you taught maybe, yeah. but in the in the early first and, two and, or three and years. And certain other classes, sort of the non-academic streams. And the language changed quite a bit oh. in high school, or what was tolerated. And uh, I used to, I, I enjoy music. I, I shouldn't say I play the piano or the keyboards, but I, I like to pretend that I'm playing. But anyway, I, I enjoy music. And uh, um, I used to like to go to the school dances, because one of the things is sometimes teachers separate themselves from the students. So unless you stay contemporary, or have an open enough mind to other things, uh, not all rap is bad. There's there's some good, and rap's been around for a hundred years. With the talking blues, for instance, that we had back, you know, in the '30s, mm -hmm. where you talked rather than and it sort of rhymed. And uh, but anyway, the last dance I think that I did, because I used to like to hear some of the, the local groups and so on. Um, a fight started outside the other end. And I went out to break it up, and so I. Grab the two guys, pulling them apart, and this other guy jumped to my back, the friend of one of the guys. And luckily, I, I'm glad the the students thought I was an okay guy, because they came to my the football help, team, and I and I told them the cops are on the way. You know, break it up, or you're going to wind up you know in jail for the night. I think I managed to get it through their their heads, but evidently one of the guys was a, he had a local reputation as a fighter, and he came out. To the, the high school just just, just, to, just to find a fight, yeah. and uh, so, but you know that that would never have happened, you know, yeah. thirty years ago or twenty yeah. years ago. What about respect for the teacher? I, did you? It sounds like you had a pretty well disciplined class, and and how far could you carry your discipline? Did that change? Or I mean, here it became really permissive. It seemed like, hopefully, it seems to be going back the other way a little bit, but where you couldn't really do much with the kid. Uh, you wouldn't have had that problem in no. the academic subjects no, no, in the no. upper yeah. even even in the upper uh, grades. Uh, I have a I can have a weird sense of humor, and I, I tried to use humor. Like I'm not a a, a storytelling funny guy, but I, I can turn a phrase or I can do something like this, and I could. Uh, uh, so I I never even with some of the. Uh, the, the harder some of the, the technical classes you might say, or the all boy classes, which can be a, a little hard to handle, I I, I I seem to be okay, and I seem to have the uh, the respect. I, I think anyway. I hope uh, of the students. So and you en you enjoyed your teaching oh, career. Oh, I loved it. I, and, I, I, I mean, I, you know, I see so many teachers that you know they're glad to be able to read. They're looking forward to can they retire, and I I think probably here more so maybe than up in Canada that it's not so much that they're burned out and I've done this so long it's 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 that it's not the way that it was before and they got so many other things they got to deal with instead of just teaching the class you know yes well that, that has happened mm -hmm. uh, the uh, um, the politics have got into the classroom and uh, our, teach, our daughter teaches grade 8 math and science, which is the last year before high school in Canada. And she notices a dramatic change from when she was in grade 8. And she says, as keeps telling us, that it's never the same. The uh, ministry changes things every year or two. So even if it isn't broken, they tend to try and fix it. And there are many more students with behavior problems in the um, general classroom, and there have been cuts, a lot of cutbacks, so that they're losing librarians, they're losing special ed teachers. Mm -hmm. So the, te the teacher that's teaching the academics is now teaching all levels of students, or students of all abilities. Yeah. And uh, if you talked with her, you'd get a real sense for, yeah, she's for a, the change. She's a degree in math and uh, science. 
and psychology. And uh, so she's got a, she's one of the few people with a really strong background in mathematics. This is why she, they've given her this. She was a little annoyed because she she liked teaching her grade threes and fours. But, yeah. And they'd also downloaded when they cut the fifth um, year from our secondary schools, and that's the year that is like junior college. When you hear David referring to junior college, that fifth year when they cut it, they also downloaded so that she's now teaching what used to be taught in the first two years of high school, of secondary school. So you've got all these grade 8 kids, 14 years old, or 13 years old, I guess, 13. You're trying to teach them physics. And you're you teaching know, them, and it's beyond their ability, sure. and it's beyond the being able, the teachers being able to, to teach all these different levels. Okay. It's, so it, it, you know, it has I changed. I mean, ask you, you had mentioned, you know, the fifth form, and I know that in England, or, you know, when you read, see movies, where they call it the first form, second form, I'm sure that's right. like the... Yes, that's right. Freshman, sophomore, or whatever. How, what? What? Why is it called form? Where did that uh, term come from? Well, it's it's a it's an English term. Yeah. We and don't use that anymore. No, we don't. We did back when we were in high school. I guess we yeah. did. First, second, third, fourth, fifth but form. But you don't know where the and derivation of that is. Then I no, I th I think it's in English. Anyway, it is English. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. Because that's what you hear about. All because they, then it moved into the grades. And, and then they had upper and lower. They'd have an upper fifth and a lower fifth, yeah. and. Uh, so there's, so that, that that's as far that was used, mm -hmm. and it still occasionally turns up, but basically it's just grades now. A little bit about Canada, um, I think we're still a little unclear exactly. Um, it was a Dominion at one time, and, and tell me how the progression. I know that, uh, you know, I remember the you know, the French and Indian War, and you know the British, you know, well, won, for, and then. Well, for a long time, because of the, the population, up until the time, basically, uh, just to make it short, the First World War, it was the, it was a, a colony, you might say, of, of England. Though it was separate, it had a dominion, they had a parliament, and so on. And they joined two of the, the parts of Canada, Upper and Lower Canada, in 1867 together to form the Dominion of Canada. And then they gradually brought in, uh, I think like the, some of the states have been brought in, like uh, I'm just thinking of um, Puerto Rico. I'm not, mm -hmm. It's it's a, it's a um, it's not a, a state. possession. It's a possession, mm -hmm. but Hawaii is a state. Right. But at one but time it used was, to be a possession. Yes. That's great. Right. Yeah, so they, it's the same thing basically happened in Canada. Mm -hmm. So places like Newfoundland and uh, they had it vote. So there's uh, the Maritime Provinces, which are just north of Maine. Yeah. Uh, there's a new, uh, <clears throat> Nova Scotia, new Nova Scotia, and uh, New Brunswick, and Upper and Lower Canada all joined to form uh, the Dominion of Canada. And then, just like uh, some of the western states with the, the land rush, you had Saskatchewan up there, and Manitoba, and Alberta, and they, they sort of, as they developed, instead of being possessions, they then became provinces. They're, instead of being called states, they're called provinces. So uh, this. Basically, it was passed, the, the Dominion of Canada was established in 1867. But Canada, as a, you might as, all, as an entity, was in existence, well, almost from the, well, uh, almost before the, the 13 colonies. Because the French settled right. before the Brits settled down in the Virginia colonies and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's, Canada in one sense is new, but in another sense is, is the same age as basically as the United States. And uh, at present, it's completely autonomous. Instead of a president, we have the queen. And looking at the problems that By the queen of England is the queen of England is our is the queen of Canada. Okay. So she it's but basically it's a ceremonial role, mm -hmm. and so certain things happen. And there's her representative in Canada who's called the governor general. The governor general is appointed by the Canadian government. And uh, so if something happens, let's say uh, there's some crisis, some parliamentary crisis, then it's up to the Governor General then to ask various parties to see if they can form a government or with the support of other parts, let's say, uh, see what they can do about running the country. But, the, but she's the representative of the Queen. 
Now the queen is largely uh, honorary and it, uh, it fills a nice niche without getting into all the politics of voting for somebody. So when you look at France where they had the president and at his funeral his mistress and his wife were side by side. <laughs> you may remember seeing the picture. Oh. You know, typically French. Yeah. But there's all sorts of uh, acrimony over over that, that, that gentleman because of his politics. And in the States every four years, you have this sort of seesaw between right. the Democrats and the Republicans. Right. So by having a queen, we, I think anyway, we, we to some extent we avoid some of this. We vote for a party. And the party elects a leader. Who's that, the prime minister? Who's, who's prime called minister. the prime minister? Right. Okay, so you, that's right. You don't elect a prime minister as no. such. You elect the party. Party, yeah. England so, does the same thing. Though. Exactly, right. same yeah. thing. Yeah. So, so that works out pretty well most of the time. <laughs> so politics it never works yeah. perfectly right. all the time. And then we have the premiers. You mm -hmm. have the governors. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, we have we governors have, yeah. of the states and of your provinces. Yeah. 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 So we have the same thing. Yeah, they like they say. Well. Uh, our democracy is terrible, but it's better than anything else. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's about it. No, no yeah. democracy is perfect. <laughs> right. But it's so, uh, And you are a democracy. Are you considered a democracy yes, as opposed yeah. to a Republican? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a Green Party. We have some of the people who, they, they never, I don't think they've won a seat yet. Maybe, or maybe one seat. But they, there's a Green Party and... Uh, What's uh, the feeling of America, Americans by, or America per se, by Canadian, the general public and the Canadians? Uh, I, I think in general, uh, Canadians are, uh, are very sympathetic to, to, to Americans and so on. Occasionally some of the politics get into it, and uh, the war in Iraq has been a bit of a, a trigger point for many people in all of North America. And uh, It can be a dividing point among Canadians, too, yeah. yeah. the war. Uh -huh. and, uh, uh, my, myself, I don't think I would have uh, voted for it, but once you're in it, then you have to, uh, I think you have to stay. So, so in, in, till it gets to a certain resolution. And if you don't, then basically other countries will look on you as, as being weak. You know, it's like a guy who starts a fight and backs off. Well, that's, yeah, that, that kind of happened in that first Gulf War. Yeah, the, yeah. The, a lot of the Iraqis thought that we were going to back them to take Saddam down, and they yeah. kind of stuck their neck out and got it chopped off. You're right. And so um, they were skeptical, and I think that was one reason, maybe early on, that they didn't join us and support us when we first went in and took Saddam down. They were, I think, they were afraid we might just back out again and let yeah. them hanging, like like we sort of did before. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. the like you're talking about. That's the the big danger is, is if they can't count on you, you know, that's not down the line. If there's some other crisis that you want to right. take care of and have somebody help you, they're not going to want to step up to the plate and do that. And I think Canadians yeah. as a whole are extremely supportive of the uh, service people, the armed forces, right. and um, most a, a large number of us have the magnet on our cars support the forces and whether they be American or Canadian yeah. and even if the Canadians don't agree with the war they support right. and the I think the soldiers. Most, most Americans are, that, are the same way yeah. too they might not agree with the war but they do support yeah. the because they know and we have know, so many in Afghanistan too Canadians yeah, yeah. that's right you do. Yes. Yeah. and uh, our daughter-in-law's brother well I guess he's there now he's yeah. being shipped out oh. uh, so, yeah. and for ourselves personally we have such a closeness with uh, the states because where we bought our cottage, the land was developed by a fellow from New York, and he advertised largely in New York State. <laughs> oh. So most of our of neighbors cheap, at the uh, lake, cheap Canadian land. <laughs> most of our neighbors at the lake are American, American. Uh -huh. and then we had a, a ski place outside Lake Placid uh, for a few years, uh, and we 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 are in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. Vermont. Uh, frequently, oh, so we're very. <laughs> but the uh, big problem it seems in Canada is the Quebec situation. Uh, it's from time to time, it, it, at least that we hear about. Down here. It's tricky, and I can. They, their language, their, their language is sort of threatened because they're 
French-speaking enclave and all, North American speaking, and the the pressure of uh, Hollywood and uh, Madison Avenue is huge, and I think this is so. If they if you don't f fight for your, your 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 language and your cultural identity, you can sort of be overwhelmed, and I, I think that that's partly that it's part that is part of their their problem. They don't want to be assimilated, mm -hmm. and. Uh, they, well, you can almost see their point because they were here, yeah, well, they long were, before you know. I mean, they're, I mean, before the British actually came. Yeah, they, they and, were they're pre-British. And, and we're a little bit different because we don't like it because foreigners that are coming here aren't learning our language and assimilating in. But it's a little different. It's not because they didn't grow up. You know, they they don't have generations and generations. Yeah. A few of the the Mexican were here, obviously, when we came, yeah. but. But you know, it's it's yeah. Yeah, it's it's a tricky, tricky situation. You don't mind if somebody uh, will, will learn the language and so on. Now, Canada, to a large extent, is oh, fairly, not completely. Well, I would say the French, maybe sixty percent of them can speak English. I, I'm just guessing. Oh, okay. But uh, among that. among English-speaking people, maybe uh, ten percent. Speak French, so so it isn't quite fair that way. But of course, the problem is, if you don't have any need to practice the language, I took seven years of French, and I can read it fairly well, but I can't speak it because I've I've lost the ability, what little ability I had to start with, which wasn't very much. But uh, so it's a. Is there a separatist movement still going on? Oh yes, it's. I, I mean, do you think that would be such a bad thing? Oh, it would complicate things terribly. It would be awful for because, Quebec. Because we have a national uh, uh, pension plan, for instance, that anybody who works there, is a, it goes in, it's managed by the government, and if the money's invested, plus taxes help to pay part, like, a little bit like your, sort of your social security, mm -hmm. but it's, an, on better, it's on a stronger footing. And what would you do with that, trying to split that, you know, between the uh, Quebec and the rest of Canada? And our, we have a national health plan that has worked out pretty well for everybody. It's, it's univer, universal coverage. And uh, each province operates its, it, own, it, it's own, own in under, the, under this umbrella. Okay. But it, there is the federal health, I mean, the if I broke my leg skiing in mm -hmm. BC, I could go to a BC hospital and show my Ontario health card, and it would be looked it's after. It's reciprocal across the, the country. And, uh, it's worked out fairly well too now with the increasing cost of modern medicine. There, there are stresses and strains on it. Now, hopefully, they can work something out because it is cheaper. Canada spends less dollars on equivalent health care for everybody than the United States does for the 70% that can afford or have health coverage. Then there's 30% who aren't covered at all, and. Uh, or whatever it is, or 25 percent, and uh, you know they have to go to the hospital and depend upon the uh, charity of the hospital. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it, it's a very it's economical that way. And uh, but again, how would you work this thing out if if you, yeah, right. it'd be like a divorce? You know, <laughs> you know I'm, I'll take the you take the dog, I'll take the cat. Sort of. I, I just can't fathom <laughs> how Quebec could win by being yeah. separate from Canada. Yeah. Who would they join? I mean, are they going to become another state? And I don't happens, think so. I think they want to be totally on their own. But the, the, our no. west, they're, they're fair, like basically North America is north south. If you take a look at the Rockies yeah, and so on, east west. Yes, and so Canada's east west. So it's it's fighting a north south pull. Mm -hmm. So Alberta, holy cow, they've got more oil in the oil sands than all of Iraq and Iran put together. And enough to last for 200 years. Uh, just they're working on the technology, and of course the price has to go up high enough. Well, they would. Some people in uh, Alberta would say, "Well, well, he could become the, the next state." <laughs> and uh, yeah, I know I have Canadian friends who, who live out west, and they would just assume, you know, from yeah. Ontario on, you know, just cut cut off the east, split split Canada in two, east yeah. and west, and they so, they feel they'd be so much better off oh, because yeah. they got the oil and they got all. 
you know, the and resources they, they, and everything. And uh, they feel Ottawa pays no attention to them because they're on right. the list. Yeah. 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 We that's, hear that's, it from our friends. Yeah. In BC. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's go back then. Um, um, when okay, uh, when the kids were growing up and you were living living there. Uh, you told me a little bit about things that you'd like to do with, uh, talk about your sailing. Did you have a, sa uh, a boat that you sailed? Yeah, I have a sailboat. What still kind? have it. It's, it's an O'Day. How, how big? It's a 22 foot. Uh -huh. And before that we had a Lightning. Yeah. And before that, no, no after the Lightning we had a Albacore. We've think. had an Albacore yeah. and a Grand Those are dingies. The Lightning is very, they're still a race. They're very popular. Did you do uh, any racing? A very small amount. Uh, we have la a laser as well. And we have a, a, a laser at the lake. And, uh, yeah. So uh, the sailing in Lake Ontario is mostly just sort of pleasure sailing. Sure. Yeah. It's just a very picturesque area to sail around. Is a lot does, it, of, does it get fairly warm in the summertime out on the lake? When you're uh, yeah, it oh, can yeah. for mm -hmm. July and August for about four weeks, three, four weeks. Uh -huh. It'll be up in the 80s, mm -hmm. so high mm -hmm. 70s and uh, mm -hmm. 80s, and occasionally hits a 90. And then Everybody just about dies. <laughs> so since you retired, what have you been doing? And have you retired oh, also? Yeah. Oh, yes, okay. 95. Okay. Uh, some traveling, uh, going to the grandchildren's hockey games. Uh -huh. <laughs> so there. Where have you traveled to? And, oh, Florida, uh, California. In the wintertime, we do a lot of traveling. A lot of our traveling is in the wintertime. We're, we're sort of heading out to ski. And BC, this BC, quite a, a bit. We were out in Washington two years ago at Mount Baker, and uh, in the summer we're at our cottage because Kingston's wonderful in the summertime. It's a great mm -hmm. summertime, uh, fall city. And uh, New Hampshire, Vermont. Most of our traveling is one. We've one both or two been weeks. involved. I was. I, I've been involved with the church. Oh, I'm about to ask you that. Uh, you're still, Are you? Is it still that? Triumvirate Church. Yeah, it's, it's quite strong. It's, uh -huh. it's the largest Protestant uh, de de denomination in Canada, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's. What's uh, the name of the one that you go to? Or Chal where? Chalmers United. Okay, and that's pretty close to your house. Uh, yeah, not, we could walk if we yeah, wanted uh, to. Yeah. <laughs> Should walk. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you uh, what do you do there? Uh, I was on the outreach committee, and Rosalie was on the uh, pastoral nurse. She was chairperson parish nurse, the parish committee. nurse uh, mm -hmm. committee, and uh, uh, the outreach committee uh, is an outreach to the community. Uh, we ran uh, this church ran a something called took in a group called Martha's Table, which uh, uh, supplies uh, very low cost meals, a dollar for a full meal for people who are. Here in the valley, they have a Martha's uh, Vineyard, I think it's called, yeah. a Martha's yeah. Kitchen, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's the same, 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 same idea, and uh, it's been quite successful and uh, has done an awful lot of good, and uh, I'm president of the uh, local branch of the Royal Military College of Can uh, Club of Canada. Mm -hmm. I sort that of is where... Somebody twisted my arm to get me into that, but... <laughs> that's where a great percentage of his... Time goes. I'm sure I can imagine. To the college. <laughs> yes. Right. And uh, what else? Uh, oh, and your flying lessons when yeah, you have fly, time. Yes, flying lessons. Oh, uh, okay. You can take flying lessons. Yeah, yeah, and I'm doing it, working on that. Uh, uh, I can have still you, look for some wood. I can still pass my medical touch wood. Yeah. Have and, you soloed? Yeah. No, I haven't soloed yet. I'm just getting up to that stage. Okay. And what kind of planes will you be? It'd be a Cessna 172. And okay. so that, that's, that's, a, that's nice. a lot of fun. All these years. Yeah, and uh, so I hope to take that up yeah. a little further. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Rosie, what do you like to do? Well, I go along when he goes skiing. So I yeah. do a lot of winter <laughs> resort stuff uh -huh. and a lot of grandchildren stuff with the hockey games. How many grandchildren so do you have? Five. Five. Oh, and okay. hockey's very yeah. large sure. in their lives. Yeah. And right now I'm waiting to... Um, I was in public health at the health unit for 25 years, and I'll be on the board, but it takes a long time for the uh, minister's office to get the provincial office to get on with the order in council. Uh, they've made it very complicated for any volunteer boards now. 
-hmm. It has to go through mm -hmm. Toronto. So uh, when I go back, I'll be on the Board of Health. And uh, Cottage. Cottage. Yeah, yeah. that's it. We're it's boats, one of those projects. Cottage, I'm doing a lot boats. of the work on the cottage oh, work, myself. Yeah, so, <laughs> so 20 years ago, I started doing the ceiling. It's going to be a cathedral ceiling oh. and, and plank. But I want to look very authentic. So uh, I put the boards on going this way. And then we've got uh, four by fours covering them, uh, which uh, fakes the look of a, a chalet very nicely. But you can live in it? Presently, oh, or? we've had the cottage for about 25 years, oh, okay, but so we, just we're just finishing it, it doing some finer things and, and uh, rejuvenating the cabin so that we can be in the cabin when the kids are up. It's and a mother-in-law's uh, cabin. <laughs> others, when they, when they, when the kids are in the mother-in-law's uh, cabin. It's yeah. grandmother's cabin. Yeah, grandmother. <laughs> I told the kids that's mine. And I've been busy, too, with the hospital looking after uh, getting the archives set up for the School of Nursing. At the hospital. Okay. Is there? Do they have a minor league uh, hockey team in uh, in your hometown? There? Yeah, they uh, they have a what they call a junior A, which is sort of one step under the NHL, mm -hmm. and they go from there and sometimes spend some time in American Hockey League. Then they in their NHL, so they're it's quite active. Then they have all the way from Adam up to uh, to Midget. Have they had any good hockey players come out of uh, the? Oh yeah, oh, yes. quite, quite a few. Uh, the, uh, Linsman, and a lot of them were the age of our son, who's Doug on Gilmore, the who, Doug uh, Gilmore. Uh, Kurt Muller, another one, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the Cashman, Wayne Cashman, mm -hmm. uh, who played for Boston, and, and Arneal, Scott Arneal, they were all Ian's age, and um, others. Uh, the two, both Linsmans R were. R Rick Smith, yeah. I was going to mention him, he played for Boston too. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite team? Oh. Our, our grandson's teams. <laughs> no, no, I mean in the NHL. The NHL, I'd say Calgary. Uh -huh. Calgary, the Senators. Calgary out west, Senators in the east. In Ottawa. Yeah. And uh, Patrick, was, yeah, Patrick's really keen on the Colorado Avalanche. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was big with the boss for the Boston yeah. Bruins when the fellows from home were playing oh, back sure. in the yeah. 60s. Yeah. yeah. I was stationed in Newfoundland uh, in the Navy, U.S. Navy, uh, as a dental officer uh, for two years from 66 to 68. And they had hockey night in Canada, you know, Wednesday oh, night, oh, Saturday sure. night. And uh, Molson Canadian, they put it on or whatever. And, uh, and I, of course, you only had six teams then, you know. Right. And so it was easy. I could keep, you know, I knew all the, pretty much all the players and all the teams. Yeah. And uh, um, that's when Bobby Orr had first broken in for the. Mm. You know, the Bruins and stuff. What and year was that? 66 to 68. And uh, so that was fun. I really enjoyed that. I don't really, there's so many teams now, and I, I sell them. When Gretzky was playing here in LA, and they, you know, they got they were got into the, were playing for the Stanley Cup a couple of years, I kind of followed that a bit, but uh, normally I don't. Well, it was there anymore. S somewhere around 67, 68 that the Boston won the Cup? Right. And we yeah. had fellows from home that were our oh. son's age uh -huh. on the team. Oh, and yeah. uh, I don't watch NHL now. I'm yeah. not that interested. Too many teams. No, that's, not, that's the thing. Yeah, it, it dilutes the... It uh, does. And if Doug Gilmore... Is he still playing, Doug? From no. Home? No. Yeah. But... Uh, he played for Maple Leafs. They've all was, retired, good, I, mean, I he, think, He was now. a very yeah. sharp player. It's, it, it's, uh, the, the rules have changed, so it, I think it, it makes... It, better for the all-around type of player. Like for a while it was degenerating to a I case know. where you had a bunch of dinosaurs. And yeah, this, I'm glad to see that. I mean, I, I love the, I like the uh, the Olympic style hockey so much better and it was more finesse and, and yeah. getting the, a lot of the European players over there. And I I, like you said, I think this last year they did change the rules so yes. that they opened the, the game up And a lot even more. with our grandson's games, you can notice it's dramatic from last year to this year. Yeah. The kids are having to get used to a new style of uh, That's good. And I hate the fights and stuff, and it seemed like for a while there that I don't know whether the NHL felt that that's what people wanted to see, and so they, I think they, made, they almost promoted, promoted all that fighting and stuff. They, or let it go by or turn a blind well, eye to it. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's too bad because they don't have it in soccer, they don't have it in... They don't have it in, in, in basketball or football. I mean, it's just ridiculous. No, yeah, I mean, the game is, is tough enough as it is without... Of course, 
seldom anybody gets hurt. They just grab their sweaters and they're all, you know, doing. <laughs> you can imagine they're trying to trying to throw a punch while they're <laughs> skating on, on, on slippery feet. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing is, is that when the guys slice each other with their sticks, and that's yeah. when people. Well, get our hurt. grandson yeah. fell on another player's skate. I think, guess that's. Yeah. It. And he got slashed. Right across his. Oh. Wow. Wow. <laughs> oh. So he had, he's got an awful scar. It looks like he got Well, I think we can wrap this up. Uh, my uh, VHS tape is finished. I still got a little bit more on the DVD, so that'll be on there. Um, so just um, uh, any any uh, any further comments you want to close with? Um, oh, how, oh, how is it? Is this the first time you've been to the Palm Springs area, or have you been here before? Once before. 18 years ago. 18 years ago. Oh, okay. Quite a, quite a change. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, you have, you have to have uh, one, a bit since then. One more thing, I, I think uh, part of my parents being able to uh, come through the, the war years and not be totally poverty stricken uh, coming out of China was uh, thanks to the uh, USAF because they were able to uh, uh, change, for instance, changing Chinese money into American money, there are two change rates, the official and the unofficial. Uh -huh. And they were able to change it at the official. And in their position, they wouldn't have been able to change it at the unofficial. So, so, it said, so instead of being 2,000 Chinese dollars to, let's say, 10 American dollars or 200 to 1, it was something like 20 to 1. So they were able to come out of China with some, some money, uh, one more little instance, I remember my mother sold their Singer sewing machine. It was the old tread, mm -hmm. and it was worth its weight in gold. I think they got enough money from that sewing machine alone to make a down payment on the house when they got back to Toronto. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> that is really neat. Because it didn't need electricity. Yeah. <laughs> it was well, interesting, too, to see within the generations how many of them repeated what their fathers had been. My father was a doctor in China. Oh. The girls were, ended up nurses, and the, man, the sons doctors yeah. and then it's even gone on to the next generation. I, I learn all this on these China reunion <laughs> weekends. <laughs> well thank you David and uh, Rosalie for coming in and sharing with us. Okay. And you'll have well, to come I, back I, and see us again you. sometime. Well I hope yeah. it adds something oh, it's worthwhile it's to your... Uh, it certainly will and um, I, um, I think it'll be something to your kids and grandkids. I'll will dig out like the, also. the photos yes, from please China. Do. I know uh -huh. where they are at the back of the closet Great. and uh, it might you might be interested in some of